What I found is that sort of color worked better if you wanted to do activism. Black and white is quite aesthetic, but particularly if you want to move people and do things and change things, it's something to be admired, but less, less of a tool. Gideon Mendel. Ah, Peter Dench. Very Privileged to meet you. I think we've, we've, we've met before. Our, our, our paths have crossed. But I, I haven't made it here yeah. to the inner sanctum of all things Gideon Mendel. Yeah. But I remember when I started as a photographer, you were one of the first in my consciousness. And that was 30 years ago. But you've been a photographer, I assume, for 40 years. And in my mind, you've always been at the top of your game. Certainly not in my mind. Um, <laughs> um, I began getting pictures published in 1983. Um, my sort of first, so that's kind of 40 years ago. I began, you know, wanting to be a photographer around then. In 1984, I got a star. I got a job with the Star, star newspaper in Johannesburg. But but before that. Before so, that. So Mendel, it's not. It doesn't. You know, you're you're born in Johannesburg in yeah. South Africa. Yeah. And that's a German Jewish name. Yeah. So, so my. Yeah. So how did your family find themselves in Johannesburg? So, yeah. I mean, it's something which I'm actually thinking a lot about at the moment and doing a lot of work on. But my parents. Both came from Germany, and um, they were both German Jews, and in fact met after the war at the, in the Johannesburg Hiking Club. Um, and my father came without his parents um, as, a, as, a, as a young man in 1936, came to South Africa, um, and in fact lost his mother in the Holocaust. And my mother, who was 10 years younger, um, came, her parents came to South Africa in 1939 and she in fact independently because she'd been sent to the UK arrived just as the, as the war was beginning so um, yeah and my parents of course um, navigated this transition from being Jews in Germany and sort of at the bottom of the racial hierarchy to being white South Africans mm. and through their skin color being at the top of the racial hierarchy and like many kind of Jews in South Africa, they made their compromises and I think, um, you know, benefited and sort of probably, you know, appreciated the, appreciated the privilege, although they felt guilt and concern about what was, what was happening. They also, you know, made very comfortable lives for themselves mm. in that really brutal system of apartheid. So that's going to shape a young Gideon, even though you went to study psychology and African history. So when did photography start to overwhelm you and how did you make that sort of transgression to that as a career option? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really strange thing because I came to photography kind of, a, you know, a bit later in my, in my early 20s. You know, I knew people at school who were really into amateur photography and have dark rooms and things and I, I had no interest at all. Um, I mean, if you want a kind of weird origin story, when... when Always. <laughs> um, it must have been 1979 or 1979, 80, I um, did a trip when I was at university. I'd been working at a pizza parlor earning any money, but for whatever reasons, I, I did a overseas trip and traveled in Europe, and my father gave me a camera. Um, for that trip, it was actually a Miranda camera. Do you do you remember? Mi no, no, Miranda. I yeah, yeah, it was a kind of SLR, but like a Pentax, a Japanese camera, um, which I took with me on the trip, and I photographed a bit. I actually sort of spent some time in London at the end of the trip, where I photographed trees. Took, took a lot of pictures of trees in parks, completely, you know, pictorialist kind of trees. And I came back to Cape Town. Um, I had the film developed, and I quite liked a few of the tree pictures and there was a kind of a professional photographer's lab and I went and you know got I think five of them kind of printed big and when I went to collect them the people at the lab said we really like these can we exhibit some on the wall and I had no idea that photography I knew nothing about photography I had no idea okay. that was, that was that's a, a thrill that, that, that was a, first yeah. exhibition yes yeah. Yeah, that, that was the first first it was a place, I remember it was a place called develop print um, and I sort of 
joined this university, the stuff, University Photography Society, and did a did a you know kind of a few you know but 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 very sentimental landscapey kinds of things. I didn't really have much um, kind of. Well, trees don't answer back, or they don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I, 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 I didn't have much much sense of it, kind of a documentary kind of way. But I also, in fact, had a family connection with David Goldblatt. Mm-hmm. Well, personal connection because I, I went to school. Another to school. photographer. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The famous photographer David Goldblatt, who, in fact, um, I went to school with his children, and we lived nearby, and the school was quite far out of town, but we needed to get a, a, a ride to the bus stop to get for the school bus and so we took turns like two days a week their family would drive you know so would drive us to the bus stop so David Goldberg used to like drive me to the school bus stop when I was a teenager um and um I kind of had this idea of becoming a photographer and um I phoned I phoned up David and said David can I come show you my work okay and at a certain point and I turned up with a bunch of kind of prints and he was like eviscerating <laughs> You know, he kind of said, you know, and, and he made quite a good point at that point, which was the kind of, you're just trying to make pretty pictures. He said, you, you're on the outside looking in, trying to make pretty pictures. I don't see anything of you in these pictures. And So was, uh, was, was it helpful then or helpful in hindsight? Or? Well, in hindsight, and I was obviously completely demolished, but I also was sort of um, kind of pretty, you know, I was kind of ambitious and I kind of wanted to do something. And... Over the next couple of years, I mean, so there's lots of ins and outs, but I began to do press work and news work and, you know, worked for the Star newspaper and then got a job working with Agence France Press covering this politics which was happening in South Africa. And my work was being published quite a lot by a newspaper called The, the Weekly Mail, mm-hmm. which was a kind of political, fairly left-wing paper in South Africa. And my pictures were often on the cover and being used as the political struggle in South Africa in the mid-80s was kind of developing. And David phoned me, he found my number and he phoned me, he said, Gideon, can you come around and show me some of the pictures that, 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 that you're taking? So I, I turned up with a kind of a box full of like tatty agency AFP prints and he kind of went, he kind of went through them very carefully and he said, um, Gideon, I think this is really, really important work. And at that, at that point he says he was on the board of the Market Photo Gallery, he said, I'd like you to do an exhibition of this work at the gallery. If you need money to do the exhibition, I'll, I'll pay for it. If you need to work in a dark room, you can use my dark room. I'll help you. You know, so it was a very generous kind of recognition. And he also, at that time, he was the picture editor of a magazine called Leadership Magazine, and he published a whole set of the pictures. So it was a kind of yeah. You make it seem easy and seamless, but I imagine you know the time frame of that. There were the usual bumps in the road. There were bumps. There were there were yeah. uh, there were ups and downs. I mean, when, when I worked in the Star newspaper. Um, there was a picture editor called Barry Van Bilo who had a huge alcohol problem and he would, he would um, disappear to the pub across the road and he'd either come back at 11 o'clock very cheerful and everything was great or everything was terrible. But I remember, you know, turning up with, you know, I'd had to photograph some you know, stupid newspaper stuff like school kids who were doing a raffle and I'd got all these kids to like throw the, the raffle cards in the air. And it was like quite a nice arty black and white picture. And I've put the picture on his desk and he picked it up and there's a whole newsroom around and he shouted, he said, Gideon, what is this arty fucking shit? <laughs> and he took my pictures and he tore them up and threw them and threw the, threw the remains at me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was, you know, and, and he said, go, go back and fucking do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but, you know, that, 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 one thing about your process, I know I'm sort of leaping ahead, but you've, you've kind of retained some of that arty shit throughout you you've managed to balance telling a story as a photojournalist you know as a having a interest in humanity and combine that with an art aesthetic and you know that's uh, it's a full been a 40 year process but you've kind of held on to that in part well i kind of i didn't know very much about art when i was beginning you know and i very you know, it was, but I, th- I, th- I think I had a particular way of seeing. But one thing I, which I was going to say was when I became, many, many years after I became a photographer and I'm not really quite sure where, where it came from, when I began looking at my family archive, which is a whole other history, I found a document which was my grandmother's 
certificate that she had studied photography in Berlin between 1914 and 1917. Okay. Um, you know, so I actually had a, I'm not a qualified photographer by any means, but I have my, I've got a, got a grandmother, and, and my mother and my parents never actually bothered to tell me that. Mm. Um, so where, where your education was at papers like the Star yeah. and the Mail. I mean, I learned South Africa. I mean, when, when I, I, I sort of began doing sort of some documentary work. I learned quite a lot from other photographers, from Omar Butcher, photographer in South Africa. He was kind of helpful, and I kind of almost interned a bit with him at a certain point mm -hmm. when he was organising an exhibition. Um, I, I began to want to print black and white photography, and I, um, I bought the Zone System book. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of basically, a friend had a darkroom in Cape Town, and I went into the darkroom for like three months with the Zone System book and trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to figure out how to, how to print. Yeah. Um, so you're very much self-taught. I don't think I have got an hour of actual photography training in my, in my background. Oh, that's impressive. But, you, you um, know, but, but learning on the job in yeah, South yeah. Africa during apartheid yeah. is probably... No, it was, it was know, a real initiation. An education. Fire. You it was. And, and you know, when I got to the Star newspaper, um, I'd never used a flash before. So I had to, suddenly I was in a situation where I had to, you know, so I had to like, very quickly learn how to use a flash. Mm. You know, because I'd... I'd sort of been working in a more documentary way when I, when I got that job and then, you know, so I had to suddenly learn how to be a press photographer. So I have kind of bounced around, you know, and but when you, when you, you kind of mentioned the idea of kind of, I suppose, being a recognised or successful photographer. And I think in any photographer's life, things come in waves, you know, so you, you have kind of moments, you know, so there was a moment in the 80s when, you know, I was working for AFP and suddenly I was on news, in newspapers all around the world and, and then, like everyone else wanted at the time, you know, I wanted to become a magazine photographer. I wanted to be a magazine, you know, um, and that was a, you know, a whole change and a transition. And then, you know, I moved here partly because I wanted to sort of try and be in the first division of okay. international photojournalism. And at that point, you had to be like either in London or Paris or New York. When are we talking, 97? I'd say earlier, like early 90s. Like, early 90s, right. 91, 92, you know. And I think actually what's happened since then is that has actually reversed. Now, in fact, if you want to get anywhere, you've really got to be on the periphery <laughs> rather than this. Being in the centre is kind of the least interesting. So but, were, were, were you seen as like a, a photographer of the apartheid and the struggle? I yeah, mean, I mean, was, I, that, was that helpful to arrive in I, London with that reputation? I think, yeah, or? and at that point I sort of had become a magnum nominee. I was sort of... So I had a bit of a reputation. Magnum? Yeah, I've heard of them. Magnum. Yes, you know, I'm one of, uh, you know, I'm in very good company for like having for being a kind of a Magnum reject. In my... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't ever get that far. Yeah, you know, so I've nom... never been rejected. Yeah, you never <laughs> even got it. So, so, so you know, obviously, you know, they're taking people as nominees, and then, you know, quite a high proportion don't make it onto the next into the next phase. So mm. I was part of that. Um, but, but was that galvanising? As well, though. do you take these knocks? I, and I think it was quite a knock. Fuel but I to think, Gideon's fire. I think, yeah. But I think the knocks have always been, and and I've always kind of, I suppose, had had quite a drive as a photographer, and a lot of energy. Mm. I mean, I think, I'm um, you know, truthfully, I'm kind of coming to understand how a lot of that is to do with as a person being, I think, somewhere on the spectrum, somewhere on the kind of, you know attention deficit disorder or autistic spectrum in terms of the way that I have like supreme focus, you know, that I can be very, very focused on things, but also very, very, um, you know. But, but on that, on, you know, the, you, you may be being flippant to an extent, but that drive, you know, over four decades to, to consistently produce at a high level, you know, and, and to have the trauma of what you document running yeah. through that entire time, I think is, is something I'd like to sort of try and hear you explain. Well, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, we, we, we've got these prints out in front of us and, you know, aesthetically it's changed from the more traditional, but you've always, you've always adapted both, you know, technically, and aesthetically, I think was is, was that conscious or was that the fault of advances in photography? I, th I think in terms of reinventing myself and reinventing my practice, it's something which has been kind of in transition. But I think it's also interesting in relation to what you say about trauma, because 
And this is something I've been actually thinking about a lot recently, is why in terms of my kind of photographic journey, you know, I began in the mid-80s, and you know, photographing the struggle against apartheid, and that involved photographing a lot of violence, you know, and many, many political funerals, people shot, people killed, you know, so there was a heart, you know, real trauma. And I think in some levels that marked me. Hmm. Well, that was initially, perhaps my initial understanding, but we're to, to keep on seeking out some of the most important social issues kind of facing my generation. So, you know, my big focus through the 90s and is still really going is my work on HIV, you know, which is obviously kind of dealing a lot with trauma. Um, and then more kind of more recently working on um, issues around climate change, kind of fire and flood, and also photographing people at a moment of, you know, quite extreme disaster where they're dealing with and processing trauma. Um, so why am I so able to kind of process and get up day after day and put myself close to other people's trauma? Hmm. Um, so I kind of tell you a recent thought and this is something which is it's really kind of come out of discussion with my son who I'm working with on a kind of family archive project which is a, again a whole other story but it's a result of discovering a huge amount of like documents about my family history um, in in Germany mostly but my, my parents were both hugely affected by the Holocaust and the other traumas of the 20th century you know my father lost his real father in the first world war who he died fighting for Germany, and he lost his mother in the Holocaust. Um, my mother lost her grandmother in the Holocaust. Um, her mother lost three sisters and a brother. So you know there was a, a lot of trauma floating around in the kind of family family history. And then they, obviously they reached safety in South Africa. And like many people who were so affected by the Holocaust, they did their best to remove difficult things from their family to quite extreme extents. So, in fact, they almost try to have no emotions, have no difficulty, have no trauma, have no, you know. So I had this upbringing which was kind of sheltered from difficulty. Um, I mean, my parents went to the extent of sending a sister who was very, very disabled physically and mentally like removing her from the family in the country, she was sent to a home in Germany because mm -hmm. they didn't want their children to have difficult things. Um, so that kind of isolation from emotion has almost maybe given me the superpower <laughs> of being able to put myself in that situation consistently and be able to kind of translate it, right? to kind of create a kind of visual... Um, I mean, do you, do you want to sort of talk through that change sure. in aesthetics? Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, the, the work in, mm. on AIDS and HIV, again, even though you use new techniques, I know when you shot the ward yeah. on the Broderip yeah. and the Charles Bell yeah. uh, dedicated AIDS wards in the UK, you used a, a, a film that responded well to low light. Yeah, sure. But you still shot in a... Of course. I suppose a traditional yeah. reportage so, way. and. And now, since I guess I'm going to say 2007, while you're still applying your work to traumatic situations, you've completely changed your approach. Yeah, you know. I mean, I, th I think I, I think I think my I mean, to some extent, I think the the subject matter has driven the changes. Um, I mean, along to, with some extent, maybe changes in kind of technology, but um, so I was very much a traditional documentary, black and white, um, I don't know, yeah, black and white. 35 mil. 35 mil documentary. Getting photo, close. Photojournalist. Yeah. And I was good at it, you know. I mean, it's something which I instinctively sort of knew how to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from, from the start, it was kind of something which came quite naturally. I was a 28 millimeter person, you know, I put myself close to things. Um, I mean, in South Africa, in the 80s, I put myself pretty close to a lot of political violence. Hmm. And I mean, a whole other area which I've been thinking about recently is kind of the nature of and the impact of my kind of whiteness in, in the way that I kind of 
was able to photograph because in that time a black photographer would never have been able to do that. Of course. You know, so I had this assumption of some level that I could be there and place myself there in all kinds of positions, which was obviously born out of huge kind of privilege. Hmm. And, yeah, it's really funny when you kind of look back at your work through those, those sort of lenses, um, it, it, you know, it, it changes the way you... you and, and lenses we're talking, so uh, like you metaphorical, metaphorical yeah, lenses, yeah, the, metaphorical. But, but you know, as yeah. well, because we, as, we are as, we are interested in kit as in, well. In kit, all right. So we we can we journey, my journey as well. My, my technical journey. So, um, I mean, I can tell you an interesting kind of there was a kind of transition. Some some transitional points is that, you know, I had done my work in black and white through the nineties on HIV in a very traditional way. I published the, the book of that broken landscape. In, in, in the year 2000. Um, I had a kind of a big exhibition of that work at the Cape Town Art, at the National Gallery in, in South Africa. These big black and white prints on the wall. And I managed to set up a whole station. It was a long show. It was like a three month exhibition. And I didn't want it just to be an exhibition. I wanted, to, you know, to do something. And I, together with local organizations and the gallery, we set up a thing where I was collaborating and with some a clinic and an organization called Treatment Action Campaign to sort of make more work which would go up in the center of the gallery in that time. And I wanted to do it in color in contrast to the black and white walls. Um, but what I found is that sort of color worked better if you wanted to do activism. Black and white is quite aesthetic, but particularly if you want to move people and do things and change things, it's something to be admired, but less, less of a tool. Okay. Um, and if, if you want to make a tool of visual activism, I just found that actually color was more effective. Um, but I had a particular experience actually, which galvanized that, which was, and some of the, 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 the changes. I was in Mozambique doing an assignment with, between Oxfam and MSF, where I was trying to make a local AIDS educational exhibition. And the task was to, one, to work with many different organizations. One was to work with a local organization of HIV positive people called Kindly Muka. And I had a meeting with the organization. I had this idea I would photograph the various people. They were all openly HIV positive in theory, and I'd photograph them, their daily lives. That was the idea. But they were kind of advocates. Mm -hmm. And at that point, finding people who were open, open about their status was really important because stigma was so, so much part of the problem. Um, and I went to the offices and there was a Portuguese translator who I was, who I was working with and he, we were explaining what we wanted to do and then things just went batshit. Um, there was like, they were arguing and fighting and um, there was clearly something very wrong and I kind of asked him to, to explain it to me and he said, well, everybody feels they have to deliver you what you need to photograph but they're trying to tell, say, say, I can't do it for this reason, you should do it. Hmm. That none of them really want. A lot of them didn't want to be seen publicly, although, um, you know, and and I think they had understood that that because I was from abroad, that the, the pictures the pictures wouldn't wouldn't be shown in Mozambique; they'd be shown overseas. Because at that point, there was a sense that you could show pictures internationally, but not locally, and that there was a kind of separation between the two. Um, but be, they didn't understand that it was, it was for a local exhibition, and I just instinctively knew I had to do something. A to change the situation, but also just to save the job. You know, I wanted, <laughs> you know, I was being paid to do it. I had to try and find a way of save, saving, the, saving the task. And I had a roll of black photographer's tape, you know, of gaffer tape in my bag. And I just went, I grabbed the tape and I went to the wall and I made a frame. I made a black frame out of the tape. And I said to the group, okay, let's just start again. Um, here's a frame, that's your frame. Um, you can put whatever you want to in the frame um, and I'll photograph the frame and you just need to explain, think about it and explain the reasons why. And that was the beginning of something, you know, in the, you know of, of something very new in my work. Um, I'd actually kind of stum stumbled on something where on, two, on one level I was empowering them and engaging them in a much more collaborative way rather than just being the, con the, the compassionate outside photographer Looking at them, I was inviting them to collaborate and think about and make a, make a, a comment. Also, I was inadvertently kind of bringing in te techniques of conceptual art hmm. 
into the process. Um, and that was the beginning of a whole new phase of kind of activist work in, in color on HIV, mm. which kind of went on for a long time. And I became very committed to the cause of fighting for access to medication for people in Africa and globally, you know, because at that point he had something which I called the huge divide, which was that people with HIV in the West could access medications and could survive. And people with HIV in poorer countries would die terrible deaths because they couldn't access the medication. And that was a really important struggle of, of those years. And I, you know, was really supportive of Treatment Action Campaign. And it was a, it was a struggle which was won amazingly, yeah. you know. And, you know, I like to think that my kind of work and input was like a tiny fraction of that wave. But I think as a photographer, there are moments when you feel privileged. Well, for me, it's been a huge privilege to feel that my work is part of something. That there are moments when your work actually is not just about you being a photographer and being paid and being recognized, but actually your work contributes to some kind of positive change in, in the yeah. world. So, so, so now you, you kind of build that into your process, the collaborative element, the, the activism and, you know, yeah, so, so yeah. The, the, the work like, um, say, from 2007 when you started photographing this drowning world, yeah. or drowning world mm. uh, of the floods. I mean, do, do you just scroll news pages looking for, you know, where's next or what's happened or or do you you know what's your process uh, yeah, because I mean, it because it is it has to be collaborative looking at these pictures it, they're very personal and... well, it, it depends what you mean by the nature of collaborative hmm. um so i mean i'm not sure i mean i do like to think i have a whole collaborative photography practice so for example in my work on hiv and aids the final manifestation is a project called Through Positive Eyes, which I've been part of since 2008, uh, which is where we actually have worked with groups of HIV positive people around the world, where we, ha which is handing over the camera, mm -hmm. and they photograph themselves and tell their own stories. Um, and I've also done collaborative work with school kids where they photograph. So on one level, I see what's really collaborative work is when you collaborate in the photographic process and you hand over the photographic power and it becomes about working people who have a really interesting point of view and can take the camera to places you could never take it and you really see inside things uh, and then I mean so this is this could this work my work on flood and fires is, is portraiture where I mean maybe it's more a kind of very deep form of portraiture very what I call a kind of deep witnessing um, where people are you know you can only do it with people who are very engaged and really mm. kind of want to be part of it, um, and and there's a, a um, you know, so. But how, how do you, I mean? Do you reach out before you go to one of these areas, or do you just is it a kind of turning up and then getting one good portrait and then having people talk about it and, it's, and it's, build a you relationship? Know, you know, the, you know, the each because because you know over over the years I've done you know I think it's twenty four different trips to flood or fire situations and each one is sort of different sometimes you you know you find people there and then i mean these women i encountered they were walking through the water to go and buy cooking oil um from from a stall on the roadside in a situation where um the roads were higher up so there were lots of people living on and kind of market on the road so they were actually walking through the water to go to the shops of it okay, effectively so a chance, chance meeting. Chance I was moment. I was on a boat. We saw them. I mean, I'm I, I'm not in the water. I, I mean, this was at the very beginning of the project in 2007, and in a way, it's a, it's a much more documentary kind of picture. As the project has gone on, it's become more much more formal, mm. and you know, in a way, I see myself doing almost like a set of, a kind of, almost a kind of almost like a forensic typology, and I've become, you know, quite rigid and I mean, it's probably my spectrum ish kind of stuff but it, but <laughs> quite rigid and fixed in the way that i you know there's a consistent way that i photograph um but i, I think i think flood in particular lends itself to that 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 kind of thing so, especially uh, with the square format yeah yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah the square format so the, the work on flooding yeah it's 
These are shot it's, on rolly flex. So you're I, wading, I, you're wading through. Yeah, it's compl flood, a, a, flood a, a land, completely you know. mad process. <laughs> I began in 2007 working with a rolly flex camera. I mean, it was just a coincidental thing, is that I sort of was experimenting with portraiture on a rotiflex when I began trying to do work on climate change and flooding and it sort of somehow, I don't even quite know how it happened, but it sort of morphed into this idea of doing portrait. It's a kind of, it's a really mad idea. Why would you want to do a portrait of someone in a, in a flooded situation? Um, but it sort of, it, it worked. And I was working with the rotiflex cameras through till 2016. At, up till that point, my eyes were getting worse. I was really finding it, you know, and I, I did a trip in 2015 to um, work in South Carolina and I was doing a lot of interiors there, which were amazing situations, but a few times it just every picture was soft. Okay. I just didn't have a single sharp picture um, coming out of it. You know, it's hard to focus, you know, and also the fact is, you know, working on film, you know, it was like a one second exposure in inside you know so the, so that i really was kind of cursing hitting those cameras and also i was get, get, getting i mean i have a, a set i have one that probably one better collection of rolliflex cameras than anyone else i've got like five rolliflex cameras you know i've got the the long lens the wide angle lens you know the the whole there's a, and there's a particular group of rolliflex nerds <laughs> you know which um, but I'm, 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 I'm well, you know, and I can't bring myself to sell them though. I haven't used them for a no, long time. No, no. Um, you, you need to keep these you know, for a display box, you know, you can't yeah, just for, have prints for, on for a vitrine. Um, but I, I, um, I, that point I was kind of loaned a GFX 50 by, by, by Fuji and, you know, so my, Work I began doing in 2017, 2018, I began working on the GFX 50 camera. Um, which, in the floods? In the floods. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that floods. must bring its own challenges. Its own challenges, but it's, you know, just a whole lot of things. Also, because I was increasingly shooting video, so suddenly being able to shoot video on the same device was great. Um, same challenges, but also just was a really relief being able to work in much lower light. Hmm. Um, yeah. Can we see a difference between um, you know so these are all pretty early early prints. Um, let me just see if I can find a, a. I mean, can you tell the difference? Um, in a big print, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just so here we have this is a Fuji um, GFX fifty image, which you can see in a big print. It's, the skin tones are much smoother. I mean, the quality is still amazing with, with, with huge prints. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I recently had an exhibition in the Soho Photographer's Quarter, the, you know, this, these huge banners outside the Photographer's Gallery. And there were like Rodiflex images and GFX 100 images at huge scale. You know, the pictures were four or six meters I saw. long. And um, they both held out pretty quick. You know, I was worried about the... The Rolliflex pictures that somehow they'd be just too grainy, but they actually were perfect. And I mean, as you'd expect from the GFX 100, the, the huge prints there were also really, really great. And when um, when, when did we go to go to fire? When so did we fire bring actually. Fire? Well, I did my first fire trip in 2018. Um, when I went to fires, and I actually had an exhibition in in San Francisco, and there'd been fires nearby in California, and I went along with the GFX 50 and. I tried to photograph in the same way that I was photographing Flood, um, and it, I wasn't very happy with those pictures. Um, I, mean, I mean, I did first decide that I didn't want to do them square, I wanted to have more of a sense of a landscape, so you can see I began working in the 5.4 format. Mm -hmm. um, but the first time I did it, I didn't feel very, I didn't feel that they were great. Um, and I sort of almost gave up on the idea, but then in the start of 2020, there were huge fires in Australia, which for me, in telling the story of climate change felt really important. Um, and I went to those fires and I, I figured out a very different methodology of photographing between fire and flood. Which is, and it's quite an interesting sort of journey because, um, okay, now, in a flooded situation, and you can see from any of these pictures, you have a flat plane in front mm -hmm. of you, um, which means it's really, 
easy place to make a picture. I think the flat plane gives you just a kind of a graphic entry to, to a picture, um, which... Fire doesn't. Fire, fire doesn't. <laughs> in, in, a, in a fire situation, it's a situation of extreme chaos. Um, and the way that I figured, I actually had a, an amazing assistant from Australia called, her name, was, her name is Annette Wooditz, and she and I, and I have to really credit her with, with kind of giving a lot of input to the way we did the, frame, the, the framing. And I had to become a super perfectionist about the way I framed those pictures. And I think you've seen the fire pictures that they are, they are kind of very, very intricately, very carefully framed. And what I usually do is I work with my assistant and I work out the composition and the framing before the person's, before the subject's there. Because they're returning to a scene of trauma. See, yeah. That's part of it. But also, yeah, I don't want them to be around too long, but I also, I just need to have, it. I don't want them to, I don't want to be trying to find the frame while they are in the picture. So I have the frame really worked out. Um, and, and you can see, you know, it, we have some of the pictures here. Um, that's pretty realistic, so but that, that people are always positioned really, really caref carefully in the frame, and particularly the kind of position of the head. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's usually, um, you know, just a, a really, really careful graphic, graphic composition to to to, um, to these images. Um, and then what I didn't realize, because I had a couple of years, so really from 20, through. COVID, which kind of slowed things down. But I had a couple of years where I was really focusing on fire because I, because I had a sense that I wanted fire and flood to be in conversation. So my main energy was on, 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 on fire. And I, I, I photographed, I did two trips to Australia. I um, photographed in Greece, I photographed in California, um, again in Canada, and went back to Greece. You know, so. I mean, not nearly as many countries as I've done with flooding, but I, but I feel I've done fairly comprehensive work on fire. Yeah, it's um, not about quantity of yeah, countries. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, as we were talking about, I very nearly went off went off to Chile this week, mm -hmm. and um, it would have been very good to have included somewhere in South America. And in terms of telling the story about climate change, Chile, which has got huge issues with drought and climate change, and which sparked the fire, it's part of the storytelling. You know, I imagine with. Floods, you have to get there quicker. Yes, because the absolutely, flood will absolutely. subside. But yeah, the no, no, theory, no, you know, no, no, well, no, no. With, with flooding, you have to be there with the water, which is yeah. a different challenge. But to finish off my my rant about composition, my, my 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 compositional rant, what I found when I went back to because in two thousand twenty two, I kind of returned to flooding. I went to there were huge floods in Pakistan and Nigeria that year. I went back and photographed flooding, and with, I only realised it after the events, but some of the compositional approach I developed with fire migrated back to the flood situations with me. Okay. So the, the, the more recent pictures of flooding are much more carefully composed and are much more kind of structurally, are composed around kind of physical structure in a way that the early ones weren't. Does it, uh, how does that impact the earlier pictures then? Do you well, dismiss them now? You no, no, they, 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 they all have a value and there's something really quite amazing and quite beautiful about you know, I mean, I think there is something about the Rolleiflex thing and the position of the lens in relation to the film and the depth of field. I mean, they do have quite a magical quality. And um, it's, it's quite hard to match that, actually. Okay. Um, and in, in, in amongst these prints, you've, you've, there are artifacts yes. that you've been collecting yeah. from floods. And, and was that or from the beginning as well? You, or was that just a... Sort of mementos that suddenly became more interesting because you know now it seems to be a specific part of your yeah, process yeah. is to collect artifacts from the yeah, fires so, and the floods. So, so what's kind of happened along this journey because it's you know 16 years now that I've been working on this is that kind of over that time different like narrative threads have emerged. So that the central the spine of both elements of both projects are. The, the portraits are so kind of the submerged portraits, and I call, you know, the, the flood portraits and the portraits and ashes, which are the other ones from the fire section. So, so that's kind of what people know. But around that, they're like, they're like lots of other kind of narrative branches. And one of them is this kind of thing where, where, I, where I collect, um, for, for, for Drowning World, I have built up an archive of actually more than 2,000 flood damaged personal snapshots. Mm -hmm. So people I photographed have given me their flood damaged pictures. And these are 
I, you know, I find it really interesting, and they're almost too aesthetic, you know, to see that, you know, and I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the kind of random impacts of flood water on the, the, the chemistry and the emulsion and surfaces of our well, pictures. You're, you're no stranger to that. Didn't you have a box uh, yes, of yeah, yes, yes, yes. in well, your, well, in your well, basement? Well, that, that came along later. But do, do you want me to tell you the boring origin, photo photographer's origin story of how that impulse kind of developed? Of, of the artefacts? Yeah, of, of the, of the of artefacts. Of course, and, that's and, why and, I'm here. Do uh, you yeah, hear boring, boring, boring photo photographer stories? <laughs> um, okay, so in 2008, I had like just done my first Body of, body of work the year before on flooding in, in the UK and India, which had been published in The Guardian, and I sort of was something which I wanted to, to develop. And there were huge floods, I mean, in, in Haiti. And I had been doing a lot of work with, with Action Aid at the time. And the town of Gonaive was like, there, were, there had been three hurricanes in a, in a month in Haiti. And the, the river Quente in Gonaive burst its banks. And, and it was a huge thing at the time. I think about 2,000 people were... were were lost in that in that flood. I mean, with the kind of earthquake happening some years later, that's kind of forgotten mm -hmm. in in history. But that was a huge disaster at the time. And with Action Aid support, I went to Haiti to try to do do pictures um, with my kind of two Rolleiflex cameras and my Canon EOS hundred. You know, what about the EOS one? Um, no, 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 no. There's five D. Was the, the first? The, yeah. The first EOS. The the I've forgotten its name. Five D Mark One. Five D Mark Five D Mark One. That 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 was the camera. We, we we can be corrected. Yes, that's okay, how yeah. I remember. Yes, okay. So I had my yes. So my backup camera was the EOS Five D Mark One, and I had my two Rolleiflex cameras, and um, it was really hard to get into Ghana because you couldn't drive there, you couldn't get a boat there. The only way in was on a UN helicopter. Mm -hmm. So then I had like a couple of days of like waiting, and actually I spent. Uh, I was told. At first, you know, it's no way, you know, you know, you're going to get aid in, you know, it said come back in a few days. So I went to some other flooded communities, which were not as bad um, for a couple of days, and then went back to, you know, Port-au-Prince to try, you know, and, and, you know, you go to the UN office every day and you're trying to argue for yourself to be on the flight. And there's, you know, you know, I have a New York Times person or, you know, all these aid people who, who's going to, you know, feed people. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, so eventually, after a few days of arguing, I managed to get on, get onto the UN helicopter, and arrived there by myself, in a completely, you know, messed up city. You know, the whole centre was under like two feet of mud, and there was like water on the outskirts. But it was, you know, it had been this massive calamity there. I managed to find a local person to help me and could sort of drive me around, and the roads were were becoming clear. But he was not a person who had any. Photography experience, mm -hmm. didn't, didn't, or, or didn't know, didn't know anything at all, you know. But he was just to help. I and mean, we went to, on my, so I arrived there. I did some pictures in the centre of town amidst all the mud, and then went out to this community, a um, very bad French pronunciation called Savannah Desole, um, on the outskirts of the town, where I found like a, a refugee, like a little area of tents underwater. And we met these people from a village who were like really welcoming and wanted to take us to their village, which was like about a kilometer's walk through the water, through like waist high water. Um, so we kind of set off and um, I had a camera bag, I had a Rolleiflex around my neck. Um, and as we were walking, it began to pour with rain. And you know those nice little leather straps you, you had on the, on the Rolleiflex? Well, because the, the strap got wet, that strap broke. And my rolly, my rolly flex fell 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 into the water. Okay. Um, I was walking along, pouring with rain. Rolly flex fell in the water. I scooped it up, but it was obviously kind of unusable. And um, but I had my second rolly flex and the, um, and the EOS camera. We kind of reached this community, and the people were really amazing. And I, you know, I was doing, um, a portrait of um, a lady at a, at a, at a portrait outside her house. And um, um, I, I was busy making it, and my assistant, uh, and I went to try to do an interior, and my assistant had my big backpack on his shoulder and had the camera on the tripod. He turned around and he knocked the tripod over, 
Um, we always blame assistants, don't we? But so, <laughs> of course. Yeah, and so my second rolly flex went into the water. I, you know, obviously it was, but I, I was really worried. But then, the, the, I, so I only had my five D, um, one five D, and it was still functioning that day. But what I didn't bring any backup of was it was a charger, and my, and my charger stopped working. <laughs> so I had no way of charging my 5D batteries. And I went around all the aid people, like no one had a, a, a similar camera or a charger. So all I could do was go back to my Rodiflexes and I dried them out as well as I could. Um, um, and I thought my logic was, well, a Rodiflex, it's a lens and a box. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it should keep on working. So I kept on shooting over the next few days. Um, but the cameras gradually... Drying out as you or rusting up and getting oh. harder and harder too. <laughs> so they're both kind of jammed on me slowly over the next few days. But you know, I shot like fifty rolls of film and I came back and most of the film was completely messed up and unusable. And basically what was going on was depending on the level of humidity and, and heat, there was like water in the inside of the lens. Um so I was pretty kind of messed up about it, but then let me just try and find a picture. What turned out is actually some of the pictures were pretty interesting. And there's something about... So that's your artistry coming through yeah, again. Well, in the, like something about the, 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 the flood water having a direct impact on the film, which becomes very interesting. Let me see if I can... Some way I've got, I've got, I've got one, one of the prints here. Um, so... so um, and shortly after that, I was in Australia photographing the floods there and I found a pile of flood damage snapshots in the, amidst the wreckage mm -hmm. and I just began to think you know a lot about yeah that kind of thing is how you know interesting yeah sorry I'm not finding it but I'll we, have we to show can, you later we we'll, can we put can, it on screen later. yeah we, we'll, we can, we can find it later we'll put, we'll put it on screen um yeah so 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 that so that kind of um that was the beginning of, of me collecting um collecting photographs. When I began working on fire, I was struck by a lot of the kind of burnt objects I've I, I seen. And I, well, I, in a similar way, I've built up a collection of um, fire damaged objects. But kind of the one bunch of things which blows everything else away is when I went to photograph the fires in Colorado in, at the start of 2022, um, I met someone who was a property lawyer, but also a keen collector of Nikon cameras. And he'd had a whole collection of, of, of Nikon's burnt. How, how many would be in a collection? I think, a I think you know, he'd, he had about 13, camera, 13 burnt cameras. Old, you know, kind of old. And he had this particular Nikon, which was with this fast winder, which was d done for one of the Olympic, you know, built, I mean, I'm sure the amateur photographer would know it what it was, but it had this fast winding mechanism mm. done for the, for the Olympics. There were very particular models he had, and they, and they, were, they, they were all burnt. And I mean, I met him at his house. I actually went to photograph his neighbor and I saw him and I went and spoke to him and he, you know, he saw my camera and he was asked, asked about it and he kind of said, take a look at these. And it was just like a pile of burnt cameras, which he was going to throw away. Um, so he was more than happy to kind of part and with them. And wait a moment. So you've started photographing um, these artifacts. These artifacts. And, and, alongside. And, I mean, and, that's yeah, incredible. And, and so I built up, a, so basically, a, a, end up taking various things back with me mm -hmm. which is I have a, a basement full of I don't make myself popular because I have How do you, you know, get through them them through customs any well what I have not what did not get through customs and is actually sitting in a um my assistant's garage in 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 San Francisco is a collection of burnt guns mm. that um, would be tricky yeah so so I tried and they just said no you know uh, tricycles Camera, bottles, cake, bottles but, but apparently even if they're completely unusable, you have to have a, like a license, you know, you know, to put, put a gun on a plane, hmm. even if it's completely burnt to smithereens. But the, but they are really interesting. But so so the burnt guns I don't have, but the burnt cameras are, I think are, I, th I think what's interesting about the burnt cameras just conceptually is that a camera is normally something which records the world through its mechanism, but when it actually records the world through its materiality, it becomes something very different. Um, so I also, with these objects, I wanted to find 
a very forensic way of photographing them, kind of as if they were precious archaeological items. Um, and I had this idea of having them, they couldn't be on black because obviously they were quite blackened. So I wanted to have, shoot them with no background, completely free of background. So I um, found a really good um, lighting still life assistant. And, you know, I didn't know it, but the way the technology works is if you, you know, take them into a still life studio and you put them on glass, you basically photograph things on glass with a white background a meter or two beneath that. Okay. And that, that gives you a completely um, backgroundless white, 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 white background, which is, um, you know, so, you know, some, you know, that's, you know, so that's, that's the way we kind of photograph all these objects, you know, so if they, they're completely floating in space. Yeah, I mean, people kind of respond, I mean, you know, so I have both this collection of flood damaged snapshots and this collection of kind of fire damaged objects. So um, I, I keep reading people kind of, not accuse, but comment that you photograph traumatic situations in this sort of artistic way. Yeah. I mean... Does that bother you, or do you? Well, how do you respond to? I, th I, th I think that is a response. Perhaps it said that you know, it's, it's like how can you be so aesthetic? You know, how can you go into a flooded situation and make images which are so perfectly composed and mm. so aestheticized? You know that. Um, and for me, I'd say it's kind of deliberate, and in a, in a, maybe it, it's a way to make people look to, to make make people look. You know, I want the pictures to be compelling. I want them to be beautiful. Um, but it, it's a kind of, there's a kind of unease, you know, in the sense that on one level you have a... Is that, is that an unease with you or an, an unease with them? Well, perhaps with, with, with the viewer, that, that you, you, you might appreciate something aesthetically, but it, you don't feel completely lovely looking at it. You know, that, that, you know that, that, that I want images to be challenging. I want, I want, to, hmm. I want viewers to um, feel there's something difficult, difficult that they're seeing, but, but also make them able to see it. So it's not just a picture of horror. It's not a picture of evidence. Yeah. You know, it's not... Um, and that's often the problem with trying to make work about climate change, is that to have a picture to say, well, the water was here, but now it's here, you know, you know, you know evidence is very hard to photograph in a way which is kind of coherent and, and people kind of want, want to look at. So for me, it's always how to make images which can work as tools. And... I mean, increasingly, alongside, I suppose, the development of kind of, what do you call, maybe conceptual photographic elements um, in my work, the, the element of activism is really important. And, you know, that's been a huge part of my practice since the beginning. But I've, I've really been thinking more and more about how to make work which works. You know, and I, and I think, um, you know, there's often this sort of desire as, from the kind of world of that to kind of pigeonhole you, you know, are you an art photographer? Are you an activist? Are you a journalist? You know, you know where, where, you know, where, 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 what box can I put you into? And you know, I think I'm I'm quite proud of the fact that my work, you know, still is frequently published in magazines and newspapers. You know, so it works, you know, it works in the kind of context of media and newspapers and magazines. And I've got a very long association with the Guardian mm -hmm. newspaper. You know, who've been publishing my work for like 30, 30 years and you know, there's still, you know, obviously a lot more of it is online now, but, you know, my work has often been seen in The Guardian and in other publications. Um, so it works in the era of media. My work also does sit relatively comfortably in, in the kind of ma gallery and museum world. Um, although increasingly it's being used a lot in kind of public outdoor installations mm. of various sorts. Um, but finally, you know, in some ways, perhaps the most important place for me is my work has been, you know, significantly part of various kind of protests and, you know, has its role in activism. And I've, you know, been collaborating with Greenpeace and Extinction Rebellion and, and, and Money Rebellion, who um, are also kind of, you know, increasingly kind of interested and engaged with the work. I had a really big display of my work at, at the Greenpeace stage at Glastonbury. Okay. So I was actually, in, in the eyes of my kids, I mean, you know, who see me as being this completely kind of naff, kind of lo kind of loser. You know, I was actually a Greenpeace artist, you know, kind of featured, you know, having my work featured. At, I think I've at, seen your work at, on at, placards Yeah, placards, as well, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, marched 
through the streets. Through the streets and alongside being a kind of a Glastonbury artist, you know, how, how cool can you become in your old age? Hmm. And I, I guess, um, I mean, I think you've had four books yeah. of yours. Yeah. So do you feel as though the, the activism part is a, is a better platform for your what? work in particular than a nicely bound, bound book on the bookshelf? Well, I, I mean, it's, it's something I, I am, you know, I, I, I like to make things which I call like tools of visual advocacy. And that's something which has always been part of my work, but books are really important and books can be part of that. I'm actually, in the early stages of working out um, my book on flood and fire, and I've been working with a kind of designer publisher in Italy. I mean, I don't quite know where, where, where that will go, but so we've got some really great concepts where we, we have this idea that we'll make, a, make the beautiful epic book which I want to make, but part of it alongside it and part of it will be a newsprint activist publication so this will be bound into the book in a way but as a kind of surface in different locations in the book it'll also be something which will you'll buy alongside the book and the design concept is if you, if you get two of these public newsprint publications it'll be a mini exhibition you can unfold them and make it like a mini exhibition which could be pasted onto cardboard and carried in protest it could be up in, on the walls of an organisation, so it's a very cheap Gideon Mendel exhibition. Oh, well, fair enough. It's a you, you, great example of um, you adapting to and, what needs to be done. You know, so so the the concept would be, you know, maybe you spend fifty pounds on the book, or you could spend three pounds on this, you know, this 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 little publication. Um, it also might be distributed through organisations and schools. So so that's a concept which is, I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm trying to work that out but uh, and it be a kind of old school but also sort of quite revolutionary I don't think idea. you're a loser Gideon just for the record for the record well you know, you know uh, doesn't every photographer have that voice inside their head somewhere <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know there, there are moments when you feel you're being appreciated but you always somehow feel you know um you know but we know we, we kind of I suppose I don't know yeah driven. we don't we don't try not to listen to that voice that then, voice yeah we? and if you keep coming up with ideas and and ways to put your work out there I think uh, you can you can bury it uh, for a bit longer thanks yeah. thanks and and I mean I think I am yeah I mean obviously this amateur amateur photography award is you know is is great and um you know I think it's very important for me that my work speaks to multiple audiences, you know, and um, is, you know, I, I do, it's a strange thing, although obviously I photograph in quite extreme, difficult situations, there's something I, I love about being out there making the work. Yeah. You know. It's, it's the Power of Photography Award. Power of Photography yeah. Award, you know. <laughs> and, you know and, 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 well, I, I, I like, I mean, look, there's lots of, it's very easy to be cynical about the power of photography um, and what photography can do in the world. And lots of claims are made for photography, you know, which can be quite spurious. Mm. But I like to think that the right kind of photography thought about in the right kind of way and produced in the right sort of way can make some, infant, infant, some, some tiny positive changes in the world. You know, that's, that's, and that's what, I mean, you know, we know dealing with climate change and global warming. Um, at the moment, it's a pretty bleak situation. You know, we kind of facing, you know, a world where at the moment when there should be global cooperation and coordination to face climate change and we can, we're more fractured than ever. You know, I mean, it's a really difficult time. And, um, you know, I feel sometimes kind of desperate thinking about the lives of my kids and, and young people, what what they're kind of going into with, you know, the, the way climate change is moving and things that just seem to be moving faster and faster, mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of feel, well, this is, you know, I can't say I always feel hopeful, um, but I kind of feel I've got to do what I can and use the, you know, what vision and photographic gifts I have to... So it's Gideon photographing say in Haiti, meter, waist deep, flood water, creatures, objects, you know, do you get concerned for your safety? Um, snakes, snakes, alligators? Are, um, I've seen, I have seen snakes, I've seen poisonous snakes, but I think I do 
always work with a good team. You know, I'm, I'm very careful about my safety. Um, I like to work standing in the water. And Stephanie, majority of the time I'm working in wearing waders. You know, so I'm not actually in the water, I'm protected. But obviously I've, I've had numerous mishaps and I've fallen, I've destroyed cameras, I've, I've had, you know, various mishaps over the years. But for me, the, the fear is overridden by the fact that I, I, I find that space so compelling. And there's something about being in a flood zone. It's the way reflections work, it's the way the light works, it's the way reality is kind of inverted. And you get reflections where you shouldn't get reflections. Um, so, as a creative person, person, I find it a very, a very, it's a very compelling environment to be. And I mean, you may not think well of me, false, but I, I'm, I, I find it. A, I do, in a way, I love photographing in that environment, mm. and it, it makes me feel, you know. And, very, very activated. And, and getting to these environments, you know, we're talking 27 plus countries that you've yeah. documented well, in the last 16 years. And it is a... Just to correct you, actually um, 15, 16 countries, okay. you know, but it's multiple trips to some countries. And we're traveling distances. Yes, sometimes distances. So to report on climate yeah, change. Yeah. So, so how do you offset in that? in your head with the the planes the that that aspect of yeah so i, th I think that's to something i think about a lot which is that is the fact that i'm you know flying a lot and of, of course that's you know not great for the for, for, for our climate um and besides just feeling guilty i've got two kind of responses to that i mean the one is um I do feel that there's this work I'm, develop I'm doing and this idea of developing a kind of consistent typology of climate change around the world is quite important in the kind of fight, you know, in, in this campaign and in, 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 in this fight we in kind of in the, in, in the midst of. Um, and it's not something that's easy to delegate. Because mm -hmm. in theory you could say, well, why do you have to travel? Can't you just commission a photographer in every place? You know, there's photographers all over the world. Um, but it's for two reasons. It's not, it's not that easy to do that. Um, so I am really a believer in collaborative work, and I'm a believer in letting people, you know, have a sense of place. So you know, it would make sense to find a local person. But firstly, these images are very much the result of me and my particular personality, my particular way of photographing, my particular kind of visual response. You know, so. It, it, it's it's not an easy. You know, I, th I think, however much explanation you gave to a photographer, it's not an easy thing to to, to replicate. And, and that kind of consistent typology is very much the product of my vision. Um, so I, c I kind of feel it needs to be me. Needs to be me there making the pictures. That's that's the one thing. The other thing is something which I, I've realised to my alarm is that. There's quite specific safety issues in these contexts, and I've learnt, you know. So I had one situation where a um, assistant, potential assistant, was researching a place I might go and photograph fire aftermath, and he went and uh, he sent me some pictures, and I saw he'd gone into a, a house with with asbestos, um, which is something I would never do, um, but he didn't just have it, didn't have that kind of an understanding and the. I wouldn't say training, but I, th I think I'm, I'm, I'm quite self-protective mm. in, these, in these potentially toxic, quite dangerous environments. So I can't really be, res I don't want to be responsible for sending other people who might not have my kind of self-preservative skills into, into, into those potentially dangerous contexts. Um, so that, so I, I guess those are the two main reasons. But I think it's fundamentally feeling that that I'm able to come into these situations with a particular energy and a particular way of seeing. And having that consistently applied around the world makes for something that's quite powerful. And you'll just have to make sure you vacation in the UK, you know, to balance it. You know, uh, I, I wish I could say that's two true. Two weeks in, yeah. in Weymouth, in Dorset. Yes, yes exactly. Yes, no. Trip up to the Yorkshire Dales. Or, or, train, or, 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 or get trains to Europe, you know. 
that's 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 the other way you know use use trains use boats but um i th i think and i, I have been obviously criticized that but I, but I think there is this issue with climate change which i do feel strongly about is that the whole the, the way it's been individualized and personalized as opposed to politicized so you know whereas i think it's something which really needs to need needs political action to change rather than saying well it's your responsibility to recycle you know and climate you know and kids often get taught that to say well we can solve climate change if you if you if your parents recycle everything and actually it's so much more than that and making it an individual responsibility as opposed to a corporate and a government responsibility is you know is is really a problem um does that answer your answer your question Peter? it does very succinctly thank you yeah gideon I feel as Thank though you. we've come to a natural end. Yeah. Conclusion. So thanks for taking time to chat, and um, hope you enjoyed watching that. Uh, subscribe if you liked it, and feel free to comment in the comments box below. <laughs>